This is HRTV Rewind, taking a look back at the racing week. You've done some good work. Let's put a bullet next to your drill here on the All afternoon right. rather than the morning. Uh, the Diana, okay. All right. our best bets. Okay. Name one famous Diana. Well, Diana Ross, right? Right in your wheelhouse. That, that, that's supreme okay. selection by that, all right, that's Princess fine. Diana. I would even let you go Diane Lane because she was in Secretary. I'd She's not a Diana, go. though. Zagora with a sweeping move there on the far outside and farthest out into the track it's Aviate and they're coming into the final furlong and it is Zagora who strikes the lead Zagora and Beta Bay fighting her every step of the way down to the line here's Aruna who's on the scene late they're down to the line and it goes to Zagora He's sort of always been in the shadow, and you know what he needs to do to get out is step up and win one of these big ones. And uh, you know, so we're hopeful that the the Jim Dandy's one of the big ones, and it sets him up for the Travers. I just thought Johnny rode him a couple of times, and you know, Johnny knows his track a little better. He knows the horses in the race a little better. I think uh, Joel did a great job with the horse, but I, it's kind of like taking a home field advantage, maybe. So that's kind of the strategy I was kind of looking behind, maybe, and going back to Johnny. We've had a freshening. Some other ones have a little more recent races, but uh, I think in, in our horse's case, it was it was a good thing, and uh, hopefully our patience will be uh, rewarded. Off the turn into the stretch, it's Stay Thirsty and Dominus doing battle here at the top of the stretch, and it's Stay Thirsty in front. Dominus is a neck behind, but he's fighting hard every step. Less than a furlong to go with Moonshine Mullen now third, but it's going to be Stay Thirsty who's drawing away in the final furlong. Stay Thirsty to win the Jim Dandy, and he is on the trail to the Trevor. You know, it unfolded pretty much just like we were hoping it would. We got into a good stalking position and just, you know, let him find his rhythm. And, you know, he just kind of kept turning up the pressure as he went along. Nice to get some positive love for this horse when you got the Uncle Mo in the barn. This was probably a pretty good day all the way around, huh? Yeah, it was a great day. You know, uh, breakthrough effort for State Thirsty. He's kind of been living in the shadows of the stable mate Uncle Mo all along. But, you know, we, we always felt like he had a performance like this in him. And, you know, it's a great place to do it here at Saratoga. So, on to the Travers we go? Well, that's the plan. You know, and uh, as soon as he comes out of it well, that's, uh, that's why we're here. You could call the 2002 Jim Dandy the coming out party for Medallia Dior. The son of El Prado hinted at his talent earlier that year by winning Santa Anita's San Felipe. The grade two San Felipe gave trainer Bobby Frankel the green light to proceed to the Triple Crown with Medallia Dior. He competed in all three races for her Edmund Gann and would have pulled a Belmont Stakes upset at odds of 16 to one had it not been for an even bigger long shot. A huge upset is looming here under the line. Sarava has won. But it was the grade two Jim Dandy, Saratoga's traditional prep for the Travers, where Medallia Dioro gave his first wow performance. Jockey Jerry Bailey was merely a passenger. In the meantime, Medallia Doro will go on to an impressive victory here. He wins all by himself as the rider pleases. Finishing second was 20 days later, Frankel tightened the girth on the Travers' favor. The win margin wasn't as visually impressive as the Jim Dandy, but the end result was the same. Another stake score for Medallia Dioro, and his first in a grade one. Medallia Dioro wins the Trevor Stakes. That fall, he was favored to provide Frankel with his first Breeders' Cup Classic victory. But Medallia Dioro was no match for the runaway winner, Volponi. 40 to one on the wire, Volponi scores in the Classic. Frankel freshened his colt after the Classic and targeted the grade one Strube as his first objective in 2003. Against the backdrop of the San Gabriel Mountains, Medallia Dioro's Strube victory signaled he would be a force to be reckoned with in the handicap division. Medallia Dioro wins easy. Wins followed in the Oaklawn and Whitney handicaps. Frankel tried the classic again, and this time it was a run at his home base. Running as the favorite, Medallia Dioro couldn't withstand another California-based runner, pleasantly perfect. 
Madai Doro's connections weren't ready to call it quits and brought him back as a five-year-old. He looked strong in winning the grade one Don, a race that prepped him for what would be his final start the Dubai World Cup. At stake that evening in the desert, six million dollars and the opportunity to turn the tables on a familiar rival. But classic winner Pleasantly Perfect got the better of Medaglia Dioro again. Now in the second chapter of his life, Medaglia Dioro has brought his star power to the breeding shed. Among his many stakes winners is 2009 Horse of the Year, Rachel Alexandra. As they come to the top of the stretch, winter memories. Oh, the rider had a check. Jose Lascano had a stomp on the brakes, and they're off the turn into the stretch. Here's Bellamy Star now up for the lead. More than real and mentor memories. Oh, look at her come on the outside. They're coming down to the final 16th, and Winter Memories is running an absolutely spectacular race. Gear down after being stopped at the top of the stretch. What a filly. Bug Juice out for the drive and running third. Then down inside, Long Hunter comes up fourth. A furlong to go. Stubbornly Fudgesicle. Great Willis on the outside. They're inseparable coming down to the line with Bug Juice third. It's going to be very close. It's going to be... Great Willis, the winner, narrowly. Ichabod Crane gaining ground, less than an eighth of a mile to go. Whip is out on Stormy's Majesty. Ichabod Crane still coming to him, but still two lengths behind. Stormy's Majesty by a length. Ichabod Crane, Stormy's Majesty a half. Ichabod Crane, Stormy's Majesty. Oh, too close to call. Stormy's Majesty and Ichabod Crane right there with him at the end. I think one got loose very shortly after it came onto the track and was running the wrong way. And of course, you've got a real loud siren and you've got horses that are trying to get out of his way that are on the outside fence. So it was, uh, it was kind of, uh, you know, kind of nerve wracking there for a few minutes. It actually turned out better than uh, it could have. So we're, we're grateful. The horse came back good and really the last eighth of a mile, he may have been affected some but Ramon did a good job, uh, you know, taking a hold of him and, you know, not letting anything happen with the oncoming horse. So it wasn't a real close call, but it was pretty nerve wracking. And we don't know how it happened, of course, but he, he may have wrapped himself. But it looked he had a little plaque of edema on the outer edge of his right front tendon yesterday after training. And we're just uh, hopeful that he had a little nick there and uh, it doesn't involve the tendon itself. So I think we should be all right. We'll medicate him for a few days and uh, rescan him and uh, hopefully we won't uh, miss any time. Voodoo swings from the back of the pack, coming up on the far outside. Top of the stretch, Sydney's Candy still. Hand ride, Beauchois trying to come through. Down toward the inside on the outside, Mariah. And now Velasquez gives a tap or two to Sydney's Candy. Bursts away to a two-length lead as they come down to the finish. And then Mariah, Beauchois, and Blue Street. And they're coming down to the wire. Here is racing's newest millionaire, Sydney's Candy. Peyton Doro bounced around in between horses at mid-stretch, but it still has the moon. Super Espresso second with time running out down to the final 16th, and it will be Ask the Moon and Javier Castellano guided her all the way around Saratoga on the lead to win the Ruffian. We're fortunate here at HRTV because not only was our producer uh, an assistant for one of one of uh, unarguably one of the greatest barns ever in the Richard Mandela barn, but Becky Witzman. If it wasn't for Becky Witzman, in my opinion, race day wouldn't be race day. Oh, that's what was great. She, what was she like as a student? Was she? She was. Student? She was good. She was. Uh, she of course. Um, was one of those, I think, torn between the business and the animal side. She really had the passion for the animal, and that's, of course, what took her in, in the first direction. And she was very successful working for Mandela and and that sort of thing. And then she branched out, obviously, with you guys, which we always love to see that. And, of course, Bob Baffert was a student well, of at course. one point. And, Bob uh, and Todd Pletcher, of course, 
more of, I like to call them the poster childs, uh, but uh, I don't know if they like that me to refer them to that. <laughs> well, they, 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 I guess they did okay if you yeah. want to say that. <laughs> You're watching HRTV Rewind with a week of racing to recap. And Curlin has taken the lead, and Curlin is pulling away, and Curlin here at Saratoga, the number one horse in the world, remains that way today. It is Turbo Compressor coming to the eighth bowl, clear by two and a half lengths. Raison d'etat second on the outside. And Prime Cut is third toward the rail. And they're coming down to the finish with Turbo Compressor. Turbo Compressor has taken them wire to wire here. Got away with some easy fractions, had plenty left late. How has Curlin settled into Lane's End since his retirement? Oh, uh, he's done he's done very well. He, he got here um, in the wintertime and was a little shocked when he arrived by how cold it is in central Kentucky. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but he settled in pretty quickly, and, and as most stallions do, he's, he's let down, and, and, and he just looks great. He doesn't love the extreme temperatures he's facing right now, but, but other than that, he's doing good. Carlin is six years old now. I'm wondering how old are his first foals, and, and how are they looking to you? Are they starting to get that big body type like him? Yes, they are, and actually, it's an exciting time because they're they're yearlings this year. So his first crop of yearlings are going to the sales. Boy, I was, I was yesterday. I was over at Stone Street looking at some of their curlins, and uh, they've got some some stellar ones, and and I've seen seen some nice ones all around. Uh, but he's he's got three up in the September uh, in the Saratoga sale, and then he's got quite a few, obviously, in the September sale. Uh, so it's it's going to be exciting. I think they'll sell very well. Windstar that acquired the interest of the um, Paul Mill Stallions, and Bellamy Road is one of them. Um, talk a little bit about how that came about, Elliot. Well, we've we've had our eye on them for for some time, and and you know we had bought uh, Harlan's Holiday previously earlier in the year, which was a proven stallion, and and so we we're continually looking for stallion prospects. Uh, obviously, Ben's my brother; uh, we're very close, and and so you know I watched with admiration what was going on over there. Uh, you know, was watching Bellamy Road, and when Bellamy Road kept hitting with Toby's Corner and. And then you had uh, Georgie's Angel come on the scene. You had Bellamy Star. Um, you know, you had probably the best two-year-old filly last year. Unfortunately, she got hurt. But position limit was an absolute freak. And so, you know, we, we were watching, and, and, and so we approached Ben, and, and uh, Ben's always, uh, he's always open to a deal. I will say that. This must have been a very, very scary, scary moment. At what point did were you able to get there? <clears throat> By the time I had gotten there, uh, it was – actually, I live across the road, and I could see from my house huge flames. Uh, By the time I'd, I had arrived, Billy, um, Billy Kuchman and, and Jennifer DeLate were, were standing there uh, and, and – and there were no horses in the barn, and it wasn't until later that I heard their heroic story of how they went in and, and saved these two mares. The, the rest of the mares were turned out, and these two mares were up, and had it not been for them, it would have been a major tragedy. Uh, it, we're, we're just This morning has been just this, this huge wave of relief and, and gratefulness to, to Billy and Jennifer and, and the team here uh, for risking their lives to save these horses. Uh, it's just... Uh, it's just an unbelievable story. You're watching HRTV Rewind, taking a look back at the racing week. The two horses that own the stakes record for the Haskell Invitation. Well, I, I remember Majestic Light. I don't have no That's idea. That's one of them. I don't, have, I don't have no idea. Bet twice. Oh, bet twice. Okay. Bet twice. All right. Fine. Name the jock with three Haskell victories. A little help there with the uh, 
Stakes record. Well, it's got to be the New Jersey Mr. guy. Mr. Jersey. Uh, Craig Perret. Craig Perret. Right. Okay. By the way, Bob Baffert, four. Haskell wins as a trainer. Mm, Looking for out. five okay. on Sunday. Two in the race. First question off the bat, why run two? Uh, well, it's a million-dollar purse, and if you get a chance to uh, – and possibly run one, two, and have that quality of horses. Uh, and it's our home track, the track that they train on every day. Uh, we figured that, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can uh, possibly run one, two. How's Shackelford been since his fifth in the Belmont Stakes? How's he coming into the race? Well, we gave him two weeks off after the Belmont, sent him over to Windstar Farm for just the rest, and, you know, the Triple Crown's grueling on any horses and people, but, uh, he came back fresh. His uh, last couple of works were pretty spectacular, and he's ready to roll. Coyle on the far outside. He's charging. Ruler on Ice Astrology next. It's Shackelford. Coyle in the middle of the racetrack. And then it's JJ's lucky train. Ruler on Ice at the rail. It's Coyle. Shackelford fights on. Coyle and Shackelford to the wire. Here's the finish. Coyle has won the Haskell. He beat Shackelford by a head. When he when he didn't break well, he moved right when they uh, they opened, and he was you know, he broke poorly. I, I thought the race was over, and I was sort of upset and um, just bad racing luck. So then I just watched Martin way back there, and I thought, well, he's going to have to be a great horse. He's going to be like his daddy point given. He's going to win this race, and. Uh, all of a sudden, at the 3 8 pole, he started, you know, moving a little bit. I thought, well, maybe he'll hit the board. And then when he uh, straightened out for home, and you could tell he was really digging in and moving on uh, Shackleford there, and I thought, I, I was almost like, it was unbelievable what I was seeing. And we were hoping for a, an effort like this, but it was, I, I'm still pretty surprised that he did what he did. And, uh, you know, we were hoping that he was going to step it up today. He had to really step it up against these good horses. And I think, you know, the blinker's off. Martin's been wanting to take him off. We took him off. He wanted to take him back. That was all him. But Martin Garcia, he rode. That was like a Hall of Fame ride, what he did today. This was over in a matter of strides and strong suit. Hughes and Hannon back in the winner's enclosure. On the far side, Fiorenti with a nostril in front. Camillion, however, has got up to win. And after a lovely trailing ride has got the split, Chacham ID, William Cecil again. Requinto in the centre hits the lead from Charles the Great on the dark side as they head up towards the line, and it is Requinto. Requinto won the Malcolm. Big box jury towards the outer. Harris Tweed, it opens up for Drunken Sailor, but he falters on his run. Can he get there? Very close. And it's Midday, who's a couple of lengths in advance of Snow Fairy. Midday smoothly is going to round off a terrific week for Tom Queeley, Sir Henry Cecil. Lost in the moment, and Fox Hunt, opinion pole all out, and just about last home. And Chandlery, under an exemplary front-running ride, is going to win the Berkeley Co Vintage Stakes. Meesner Shankaday continuing to close, but nowhere near fast enough. And a great day for Frankie Dottori, a staying double, as he also wins the iShares Philly Stakes. Can Canford Cliffs, who's drifting left, reel in his rival? A decisive no. Frankel, unbeaten, utilizes that turn of foot to devastating effect and wins the Kitco Sussex Stakes. What a brilliant horse! Here with everybody's favourite, Julie Crone. She's put me in a hole so I don't look quite so tall. Right, I've, Julie? I've been known to do that. <laughs> Tell me, what are you doing back in the tack here at Del Mar? Well, it's for the cause. Uh, there's a lovely race, um, the St. Ledger's Festival, the Fall Festival at Doncaster Racecourse. And they've put together two charity events for uh, the racing, and for one of them is to help the house that Jack built. And uh, there'll be some jockeys uh, coming out of retirement there. And I'm one of them. So how have you been preparing for your comeback? You're outside the Mandela Barn. Well, I had, uh, after two days, I think I got on like 15 horses or something, and I had to take three days off <laughs> because I was walking like, oh, I was pretty sore. I was pretty sore. And then, um, but I kept saying it's for a good cause. It's for a good cause, you know. 
And uh, then I had three days off, and I came back pretty good after that. But he's known to not be that easy on people. <laughs> Do you think you'll get the bug back? Could you have a comeback, Julie? You mean I get the bug back? <laughs> Whoa, nobody told me about this. <laughs> if we gave you a bug back, would you come back? Yes, positively. If I had 10 pounds right now, yeah. <laughs> well, guys, that's Julie. It's always fun to talk to Julie, and uh, she makes me look tall. She's in a hole. <laughs> <laughs> Well, King, something that many people probably don't know about you is you have amassed quite a tie collection, almost as many neckties as you have winners. Uh, where did this passion come from, and what will you be donning tonight? Listen, uh, here's the thing. I started out wearing uh, uh, flip ones, uh, <laughs> I have to admit. And then Larry Abundi, who's our racing secretary in Maryland for many years, used to make fun of me. And finally, what it started, it was Chris Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Chris Lincoln, the first time I ever met Chris Lincoln, I, I admired his tire. He said, you like this tie? And he said, you like this tie? I said, I sure do. He takes it off and gives it to me. And that kind of started. It was a horse tie, of course, and that's all he wears is horse ties. And so then, then the friends of mine and my family for birthday and Christmas, what do you get King Leatherberry? Well... You get him a racehorse tie. So over the years, it's just built up and up and up, and, and it's got a little bit of a reputation for that. Kardashian short lead. Car Thief is right there, trying to split foes. Then Ben's Cat to the outside, Philly bound. It's Kardashian, Car Thief. Here's Ben's Cat now clear. Kardashian, Car Thief, Ben's Cat coming. Ben's Cat got up to win the Governor's Cup. Down the stretch they come. Alsace Hanover with the lead and opens up. Powerful Mist, Custard the Dragon in the Lightning Lane. Hug a Dragon on the outside with Wind Me Up. But they won't catch Ron Pierce and Alsace Hanover, the winner in 148 three fifths. A world's record. Three year old Pacing Galdings. Broke the world's record by a fifth of a second. Watch this champion here, all says Hanover and Ronnie Pierce. Tony O'Sullivan going to romp to a victory as the camera zooms in on the 2011 Adios winner, all says Hanover and Ronnie Pierce. Ron Pierce with his third Delvin Miller Adios Pace Championship. A tough decision to make to pull first over. Did you keep checking over your shoulder to see if anybody was coming uh, as you were heading toward the 3 8s? No, not really. I, you know, you could hear them back there. The track's kind of firm, and you could hear them, so I, I couldn't hear anybody. Never had thoughts of sitting. You wanted to get out? I, I definitely. All I had to do is just feed this horse uh, some racetrack today. Tony had him up on his toes and ready to go. That's all for Rewind this week. Here's a look at what's coming up next week on HRTV.